What have you been listening to lately? What have you been listening to lately? It's a question we ask all of the time, right? It's a question that makes sense if you think about the context that we live in. We live in the rise of the smartphone. We live in a time where you can access any music, anytime, anywhere. We live with the never-ending release of podcast episode after podcast episode, and we've grown accustomed, accustomed to listening to this chorus, this chorus of noise. We've even made it possible, right, to have transparency mode in our AirPods so that we can have our ears listening to two things at once, the world around us and the world in our pockets. It's not all bad, though. It's not all bad personally, and I'm sure you could say this too. I have benefited from being able to listen to the voices of others. I have benefited from good sermons and good audiobooks and good podcasts. I have grown in my knowledge of God and the world around me by listening to the voices of those who have been here longer than I have, who have dedicated their lives to studying these things. And so it's not all bad, but as I've said before, a couple of weeks ago, actually, there are dangers in the noise. There are dangers in the noise. There are dangers. First, there's the danger of becoming attracted to the voice of a false teacher. There is the danger of becoming accustomed to another person's discernment without actually growing in discernment ourselves. There's the danger of listening to music or voices or lectures that have a negative impact on us emotionally and spiritually and even physically at times. You know this. You know from listening to that album that you know recalls in you the sadness, this sense of despair. You know the power of another's voice. Ultimately, I think one of the most dangerous things about living in a culture full of noise is that we become callous to the voice above all voices. We become callous to the voice that truly matters. And in Psalm 10 this morning, Psalm 10, or Psalm, not 10, Psalm 19 this morning, in some sense it was written to clear away the chorus of noises. It was written so that we can listen to and attune ourselves to the voice above all voices. In Psalm 19, we're going to see our brother David answers the important, the all-important question, where has God revealed himself? Where do we go to listen to the voice of God? If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, you might be tempted to think that the the first answer, the only answer, is Scripture, the Bible. The Bible is the singular place where I go to hear the voice of God. And if that's your first impulse, I just want to say that's a good impulse. That is a good impulse. If your first impulse is to run to the scriptures, then I'm not going to stop you, and David's not going to stop you. But David is here to remind us in this morning, remind us that the God who reveals himself in scripture also reveals himself in creation. Nature and scripture. Charles Spurgeon called it the two books of God, the book of nature and the book of scripture. Both are of God, both are from God, and both are uniquely designed by God to reveal God. This is one of the unique aspects of our faith. As followers of Jesus, we confess that knowing God is possible only if God reveals himself. Right? We are finite people approaching an infinite God. We can't know him in our own strength, in our own intellectual prowess. And so uh, the good news of this psalm, ultimately this morning, is that God has revealed himself. And he's done it in two books, as Spurgeon called it. And so we're going to look at book one, the book of nature, and book two, the book of scripture. 
And then we're going to end by reflecting on the question, how should we respond to these books from God? And remember, books is just, it's an analogy, it's a metaphor. Creation and scripture, that's, that's where we're going this morning. So look with me at verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, that is the heavens, God has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man running its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. John Calvin once said that we cannot open our eyes without being compelled to behold God. We cannot open our eyes without being compelled to behold God. God. That is ultimately what David is saying right off the bat here in Psalm 19. When we look at the stars above and the earth below, when we get up in the morning and we see the sun rise and go to bed at night and see the sun set, all of it is compelling us and urging us and inviting us to behold God. Think about the way that we are designed as humans this morning. Think about this. We are the only creatures on planet Earth who look up at the night sky and go, whoa. Quite literally, animals, mammals, fish of the sea, birds of the air, they're horizontal creatures. They don't look up in awe. They don't look up in wonder. We are the only creatures made to do this. I don't know if you know this or not, but just as a reminder, this morning, monkeys do not compose poems about the stars. Elephants don't write books about the Milky Way or the Grand Canyon. Birds don't film documentaries called Planet Earth. Only we do this. Only we do this. This should tell us something. You know what it should tell us? It should tell us that human beings, male and female, have been made in the image of God. We have been uniquely designed to agree with David when he says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. He continues, day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. In other words, creation is a perpetual witness. It is never quiet. We can turn our faces we can act as if we aren't being compelled to behold God in creation, but the reality is that when you and I wake up in the morning, there it is. Unrivaled glory. Unrivaled majesty. There is nothing like it. Didn't we see this a few weeks ago in Psalm 8? O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The, the skies above proclaim your handiwork. You've set your glory in the stars. One early Christian, with a name I won't even try to pronounce, said it like this. If you observe a mighty and magnificent building, you admire the builder. If you see a skillfully designed ship, you think of the shipmaker. And at the sight of a painting, does not the painter come to mind? Much more than does the sight of creation lead us to the creator. That is what creation always does. It, it says, look at me, and then bounce your eyes up even further. Nothing creates itself. Nothing has the capacity to bring itself into existence, which is why the scriptures can say, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It is foolish to look at the greatest piece of art in the history of the world and say it has no artist. Is it not? The heavens declare the glory of God. Just to grasp the, the just to grasp this, there are there are fools all around us. Just feel the foolishness of this. Imagine walking up to the person who made your favorite album, or the person who made your favorite movie, or the person who made your favorite piece of art. Imagine walking up to them and saying, "You didn't make that. 
There's no way you could have made that. And yet their fingerprints, their DNA, their personality is all over the art. The heavens declare the glory of God. And I just said that there are fools all around us, but let's recognize here that apart from Christ, we are the fool. Romans 1, although we knew God, we didn't honor him as God or give him thanks. But we became futile in our thinking and our foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to become wise, we became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for creation itself. Apart from Christ, we are the fool. But let me just re rephrase something Paul says later on in Romans. While we were still fools, Christ died for us. You might have never said in your life, there is no God, but by your actions and in your heart, you have said it one way or another. Christ died for fools to make them wise. Okay, so that, we're running quick this morning. That's the book of nature. That's what I, there, there's much more we could say this morning, but what I want you to remember is that when you look at creation, it is compelling you always to behold God. To paraphrase verse six, nothing is hidden from its heat. Its voice is always going out. So David turns, doesn't he, in verse seven to the book of scripture. Look with me. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. So I don't know if you noticed, but when David moves from the book of nature to the book of scripture, there seems to be a heightened sense of importance, a heightened sense of relevance, especially for us. I mean, think about it. D David says that creation, the heavens do one thing, proclaim glory. The heavens proclaim glory. Contrast that with what he says about Scripture. Scripture does seven things, does it not? It revives the soul, makes wise the simple, rejoices the heart, enlightens the eyes, endures forever, warns and reward, rewards. So it's as if nature is kind of, it's God's passive voice. It's just there. And Scripture is God's active voice. It is coming into your heart and my heart to have an effect. And it's, it's amazing to me that the first thing David says the scriptures do is revive the soul. Revive the soul. If there's one thing that nature can never do, that, do it's that. Nature cannot revive our souls. You can know this by reading the famous book Walden by Henry David Thoreau. He went out in nature to try to find his true self, to try to find the meaning and the purpose of life. And you read, you read the book and you walk away just feeling like the man's still empty. The man has lost it, trying to find it in God's creation and not in God himself. Nature can't revive the soul. We need more. We need more. Why? Why can't nature revive the soul? It's not because there's a defect in nature. It's not because there's, that, that nature is faulty. Nature was designed to do one thing, declare glory. Paul says in Romans 1, it reveals certain aspects about God, his power, his glory, and his divine nature, his invisibility. Gregory, another early Christian, said, through the beauty that you see, imagine the beauty of the unseen. That is what, script, or that is what creation does. But notice the words David uses to describe scripture, not just its effect, but what it is. It is perfect, sure, right, pure, true, righteous, finer than gold, and sweeter than honey. Scripture 
is transformative. You know this, right? Scripture is transformative. If you've been a Christian for any amount of time, I'm sure you know that God loves, one of the primary ways that God loves to work on you and I's heart is through the word of God. You know that the Holy Spirit loves to form you, to shape you, to convict you, to rebuke you, to comfort you. Not through the stars, but through the word. Hebrews says it best. Hebrews says it best. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the division between bone and marrow, soul and spirit, revealing the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. That's what David is saying about the word here in Psalm 19. Scripture pierces the heart. The heavens don't do that. Scripture reveals us. The sun and the moon and the stars don't do that. They have their purpose, but they don't do that. Scripture warns and rewards us. By them, your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. So David wants you to know that the word is always effective. You you can always know that the word is the one place you can go to and be utterly transformed. Utterly transformed. When God speaks, we know this, right? When God says, let there be light, what happens? There is light. When he whispers, stars are born. When God speaks, our hearts of stone become soft. When he speaks, prideful people are humbled. When he utters his voice, the weak are made strong and sinners are saved. So just stepping back for a moment, book of nature, book of scripture, we can rejoice in the book of nature. It is a gift. God has revealed certain aspects of his character in nature and in the heavens, but nothing comes close to scripture. That's the idea here. Nothing comes close to to scripture. If all we had was nature, we would be lost. Henry David Thoreau was lost, and all he had was nature. Friends, that's not all we have. So David holds both of these books together, the book of nature and the book of scripture, and he shows us really that the book of nature points us to God, it points us to the scriptures, and the scriptures help to clarify what nature is always doing. The heavens declare the glory of God. The scriptures tell us that, right? So my first encouragement to you this morning, my first encouragement from Psalm 19 is to take up these two books and read. Take up both the book of nature and the book of scripture and read them as if your lives depend on it. Read the two books as if your lives depend on it, especially scripture. When you're getting nothing from nature, when you're not even feeling like, I can't even see glory, go to scripture. Go to scripture. What does Jesus do in the wilderness? Satan says, turn these stones into bread. Notice, Satan knows that all Jesus has to do is speak and reality obeys. He gets the power of the word of God. Turn these stones into bread. And what does Jesus say? It is written Man doesn't live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The same is true for us. In our wilderness, called the world, the flesh, and the devil, we need every word of God, and we have it in Scripture. David knows this. David knows it from experience. This is that Scripture is never abstract. David knows from experience that the law of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul because it revived his soul. He knows that the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, because David found real joy-inducing truths in the scriptures. And when he says, think about this, when he says in verse 10 that the scriptures, the words of God, are more to be desired than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey, he knows as the king of Israel who has more access to honey and gold than you and I ever will, he knows that the word runs even deeper. It is sweeter. It is, it is shinier than gold. It will buy you 
what you can not buy with gold, which is salvation. The word leads us to salvation. And so my question to you this morning is, is do you find to, the word to be more desirable than honey and gold? Or name your favorite thing. Do you find the word to be more desirable than that? It's interesting how David begins with creation, and then he points to something in creation and says the word is better than that. There's a clear difference here. It's my prayer for us this morning. I can't tell you the number of times that the word of God has been a balm to my soul. I can't tell you the number of times that I have been rebuked, rebuked and convicted when I was wandering and wavering, and the Lord gave me a lamp to my feet and a light into my path. That is what he has given us. The prayer is that we as Trinity Church, any visitors here, will be able to say with David, the word is perfect, sure, right, pure, true, righteous, finer than gold, sweeter than honey. All right, we're going to get just a little bit nerdy here for just a second, okay? Because this is really important to see. This is, this is kind of mind-blowing. In verses 1 through 6, when David speaks about the book of nature, he uses one Hebrew word to describe God. It's the word El. Maybe you've heard Elohim. It's where we get that word from. He uses one word to describe God. It's the Hebrew word El. That's the word in the ancient world that everyone uses to describe God. God is El, El. The heavens proclaim the glory of El. But notice when he gets to verses 7 through 11, he does not call God El. He, he moves even deeper and calls him Lord. When he gets to scripture, he calls him Lord, and in Hebrew, it's Yahweh. It's the name that God revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai. I am who I am. So we see in the very structure of this psalm that, yes, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. They do, and it's the same God in both books. They tell us something about God, but the scriptures are what bring us into personal relation with God, where we move from El to Yahweh, where we move from God, which anyone and everyone can say, to the Lord. Hear the invitation this morning. All right, I said at the beginning that we would end our time by asking how do we respond to God's two books. How do we respond to nature and to scripture? And the best way to answer that is to see how David himself responds in verse 12. He says, who can discern his errors? Declare me innocent from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Let the, wor the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This is where we're going to close our time together. I want you to see three things here. Three things. I'll have them up here on the screen. For David, first, the two books of nature and scripture lead us to repentance and faith. It's interesting that David's response to everything that has come before is who can discern his errors? In light of scripture, in light of nature, who can discern himself? It's as if nature and scripture, creation and the word are coming together and awakening David to his own sinfulness, his own need for repentance. And he doesn't call, he doesn't call his sins misunderstandings. He calls them errors. He doesn't call his sins failures to understand. He calls his sins presumptuous sins, which is, you know you're rebelling. You know you're rebelling. And I already quoted Hebrews, but the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, so it's going to come and pierce our hearts, but it's going to lead to repentance, which is transformation, and faith. He does call God my rock and my redeemer, does he not? Turning away from sin and self and turning toward God and the gospel of grace. Second, for David, the two books of nature and scripture Help us see our need 
for God's mercy. I want you to notice just one, one word. Declare in verse 12. He is saying to God, only you can declare me innocent. I cannot clean myself up. I cannot save myself from my sins. And so he asks God to make a declaration over him. Make me innocent. That is exactly what God does to us in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Galatians 2, we know that a person is not declared righteous by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So if you don't know God this morning, if you don't know Christ, here's the invitation. Look up and say, declare me innocent. Declare me innocent, and God will. He will do it because of his son, Jesus Christ, who is innocence on our behalf. Last thing I want you to see here. For David, the books of nature and scripture show us that God himself desires to be our, your God. Where does the psalm start? It starts in the heavens with the God of the heavens, El. Where does it end? On the earth with the God of the heavens coming down and revealing himself and making himself known as Yahweh, as the Lord. I am who I am. What does Jesus say? Before Abraham was, I am. God wants to be with his people. Let me just read one more passage of scripture. John chapter one, the true light, Jesus, which gives light to everyone. The heavens declare the glory of God. Was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him. And yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people, Israel, did not receive him. But friends, listen to this. All who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's what the two books of God do. The book of nature and the book of scripture show us that God wants to be with us as our God. He wants to adopt us into his family, which leads to the last thing that David says, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Can you say that about the God of the heavens? If you're a Christian, if you have trusted God, you can say, my rock and redeemer. I want to close our time together just by reading what David says at the very end. Um, I'm replacing my with the word our. I've got it up here on the screen. So would you close our time with me by reading together this? Let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.